building as we speak even. Uh, today seems to be a pretty volatile day in the markets. Uh, we have moves outside of the equity markets as well, so we might touch on those. But before we go any further, please take a few moments to read over the hypothetical trading disclaimer, and then we can continue. So starting off today, looking at Netflix subscriber growth, the company reported earnings yesterday after the close and disappointed quite significantly on this metric. So subscribers have kind of become, in many companies, almost more important quarter to quarter than an EPS or than a revenue figure because these Subscribers are both crucial from a revenue profit standpoint, but also it helps highlight how effective the company is being in its product offering, in their conversion, in their sign-up rates, everything under the sun, really. So these have gained a lot of importance, and I think that's why this piece of data or this metric was scrutinized so heavily by investors. We can see Q3 2020, only 2.2 million subscribers were added. That's down significantly from 10 million the quarter prior. Now, take the last two quarters with a grain of salt because Netflix was positioned perfectly to benefit from the world going into lockdown and everyone being stuck in their houses for months on end. Uh, and the company said as much in the report However, I would argue much of the world, at least much of the world that is able to use Netflix, um, is still in some form of lockdown or some form of, unlike they were living prior to COVID. And that should provide somewhat of a tailwind still for Netflix. So to see them miss their expectations by 1.4 million subscribers for the quarter is pretty concerning. And it might just be a hint or the tip of the iceberg that some of these companies that were positioned so well for COVID are starting to see those tailwinds die out a little bit and their growth might come back to... Uh, pre-COVID levels, or even beneath that. Now, we'll have to get more clarity on that coming up in the next few weeks from companies like Facebook and Microsoft, Amazon. But for the time being, Netflix is the first of the FANG members. It's been responsible for quite a lot of growth on the NASDAQ as one of those high-flying, quote-unquote, tech stocks. I don't think it should be considered a tech stock, but many consider it as one. Um, regardless, if we start to see a broader pullback in these COVID favorites, the ones that are really receiving a boost off of this pandemic, then that could really undermine um, some of those high flyers and kind of that new basket that these financial news media um, publishers have arrived on, that being the work-from-home stocks. So early warning signs here from Netflix. We'll have to see if that transitions any into anything more broadly. Uh, we can take a look before we dive into IG charts. We can take a look at Netflix already or in the live view. Um, and we can see a pretty substantial gap lower here down from about 525 down to 490. So continuing its losses from yesterday after the close early today, I think that's very fair given the miss 
So that's where Netflix stands. As far as the other FANG members go, biggest day on the horizon, in my view, will be next Thursday. We can take a look at uh, Earnings Whisper here. So next Thursday, we have Twitter and Spotify in the morning. But I think more importantly, after the close, we have Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Starbucks. And those are just the big four. So Amazon, Apple, and Facebook are three of the four or five largest companies on the NASDAQ and the S&P 500. That means Thursday alone is going to be responsible for so much makeup of those two indices. And if we get a result similar to what we saw today or last night from Netflix, that could really begin to inject some volatility and instability into the market just from these single names. Because as it stands, Amazon and Apple are going to be worth more than 10% of the NASDAQ just by themselves. So incredibly incredibly important stocks coming up next week or earnings coming up next week and that will be the big story really as the stimulus talks between republicans and democrats are still locked in we've seen both sides say that they're willing to work towards a deal or that they're willing to compromise or that something isn't quite to their liking All in all, there's been a lot of back and forth with no concrete progress. So this morning, Larry Kudlow came out and said he's optimistic that a deal can be reached. I think we've seen that headline countless times throughout the last three weeks. So wouldn't hold your breath. But if we're to believe the headlines, it does seem like a stimulus deal is getting close. That would be negative for the dollar and positive for U.S. indices, and especially some of those stocks that could really benefit from another round of um, checks sent out to the American people. So now looking to the Dow Jones for a little bit of a technical overview as we transition into some price action analysis. This time last week, we were kind of playing out in this ascending band and it has acted as resistance in the latter half of September and then for the majority of October up until more recently. Last week, we were calling it out as a little bit of an area of support and if we jump down to the hourly view, you can see that there was a lot of indecision around this area. We have some some long wicks with small bodies, typically indicative of some indecision. Um, however, we did eventually suffer a breakdown, falling to secondary support around the 28,190 level. That's a Fibonacci that we have outlined. And as we fast forward to this week, it seems as though Really, this FIB level down at 28,200 or 28,180 is going to be the first area of support, while the next FIB level higher up at 28,560 is likely going to be an area of overhead resistance. So, when we're dealing with horizontal levels like this, it really makes a pretty ideal landscape for range trading opportunities. Now, there's little to suggest that these FIB levels are going to hold perfectly and that it's just going to bounce back and forth in a range indefinitely. No, not quite. However, we can look to use these FIB levels as 
either areas of invalidation or entry points or areas of interest when you're looking to trade these shorter time frames. So in our shorter term view, maybe the rest of this week into early next week, it looks as though weakness might prevail for the time being. A ton of tests down at this FIB level, the supportive level, are not the most encouraging. While it is promising that the line is held upon the successive tests, um, if price keeps making it back to that area, well, that is certainly a symptom of weakness. And then on the other side, just dating back to yesterday morning, really, uh, we have a series of lower highs. So if anything, we have a little bit of a a wedge forming out here. But at this point in time, a shorter term view looks to be something of a consolidation pattern, maybe a little bit more cons or contraction. Uh, just as we wait for a stimulus, clarification, or progress really at all. So those are the two levels to watch in the shorter term Friday time frame 28200 and 28560 now looking over to the nasdaq 100 last week we highlighted a possible cup and handle formation that's a technical pattern that we don't really see too often it's one of my favorites but as I said, pretty infrequent. And you can kind of see the formation that we were discussing here. So this would be the cup. And this would be the beginning of the handle. Now, ideally, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of a, an abrupt reversal here to really etch out the left-hand side of that handle. but. I would argue we're still roughly in play for that formation. So if it does pan out, as the textbook example would suggest, that would mean some further consolidation around where we are now, and then an eventual uh, recovery up into this line that's drawn off the brim. So that would be around maybe the 12,150 mark. And that would effectively complete the potential cup and handle pattern. We'll have to see if that plays out. I think on the shorter term time frame, I apologize, there was a helicopter overhead. Uh, I think on the shorter term time frame, what's well, encouraging kind of in play or in line with the Dow Jones is this support level holding here. This is around 11,600. We identified this last week as an area that could come into play as subsequent resistance if this FIB level around 11,800 broke. And we did see some tests in there, a positive bounce higher up into resistance again, only to eventually break lower. So now the NASDAQ looking for secondary support around this 11,600 level. And really, I think the, the influence, let me pan back out to the four hour actually, I think the influence derived from this level is super, super cut and dry. Uh, just looking back to early September, we can see all the different occasions that this FIB level and really this band now um, has had over the last two months. So shorter term timeframes, this 11.6 level going to be very important to watch. If it holds and we begin knocking on the door of 11.800 again, 
that could be an early indication. We're looking to complete the right side of the handle on this potential cup and handle formation. And again, to reiterate last week's education point, uh, cup and handle pattern typically viewed as a bullish continuation. So this would all be viewed as healthy consolidation. Initially, a larger consolidation, then a secondary consolidation, building on a series of higher highs, excuse me, on a series of higher lows, and then continuing a longer term uptrend. Uh, that's what we're going to be watching for here. It's too early to say, but again, holding above 11.6 is vital in the formation of that pattern. If 11.6 breaks, then I think further selling is on the horizon, and we could look to, first and foremost, maybe this fib level around 11.360. That could provide maybe a little bit of intraday influence. However, I think over the longer term, the bigger level to watch would be down off of these three swing lows. And that's going to be around really 11 to 15. Um, I'll even draw a band this week so we can check back next week and see how that has played out. So that's going to be around 11 to 15. I think that's the more important level to watch if 11.6 breaks. And if it does, that might mean further selling is on the horizon and we're stepping out of healthy consolidation and into maybe a larger contraction. So that's how I view the NASDAQ. Uh, I'll likely have a piece out on that later today, just identifying some of the levels and um, talking about potential outcomes. Now, moving over to the S&P 500, much of the same can be said for the collection of 500 stocks here. Working with support today as equities look to be a little pressured. I really am not a big fan of the technicals on the S&P 500 chart right now. They just don't work out quite as clean as I think they do on the NASDAQ. So I don't have quite as much drawn out here. Uh, we can begin to paint a little bit of a picture and that would be something of a descending channel. However, you can see still in its very early stages. Um, and it could in fact even be just a an uglier version of the cup and handle pattern that we're talking about on the NASDAQ. Now, whatever happens, happens, I suppose. But I think what is going to be more important for the S&P will be holding above this 3,400 level. This is a zone that really in the past six months has played a pretty big role time and time again, both support and resistance. Can see just in this, September Fib level or Fib retracement that we have drawn here, it's the midpoint. Um, technically, 50% Fib level isn't a Fibonacci point in the sequence. However, I do think it's noteworthy uh, when looking at the stock retracements. So 3,400 in conjunction with the potentially downside of a developing channel here, that's going to be a pretty important zone if weakness continues. If we break beneath that, I think the door will open for a continuation lower. And um, that would likely also erase any potential cup and handle formation. Uh, Kieran asks, how does the descending channel differ from a bull flag, please? Well, really, it doesn't, quite simply. Um, 
as we pan out, we can see the bull flag formation a little bit more cleanly. So again, just like the cup and handle, uh, bull flag going to be a pattern of continuation. So you could argue that we have a developing bull flag here. And actually, I think that's that's a pretty sound argument to make at this point. Again, just like my concerns on the NASDAQ, for that pattern to unfold and play out, we would just need to really keep its shape quite firmly. Um, and that's why I think breaking this 3,400 level at any point would kind of eradicate the bullish hopes here. So a descending channel in the shorter term, maybe letting that bull flag extend a little bit more. And if we break and kind of muddy that flag formation, then the flag is gone, the channel is broken, and we have a, a longer term downtrend, I think. so. To answer your question, it really doesn't differ from a descending channel too much at all. Um, it kind of depends where it appears in the broader price chart. So you need some setup beforehand for a bull flag to take place, like a rally beforehand. So if this decline happened um, after months of prior declines, well, it would be hard to argue a bull flag if price has been declining for months and weeks. So you do need some setup prior. Um, but good, good point to raise there. That will be something to watch as well. Now moving over to the DAX 30. Last week, we were outlining resistance up at this 12,940 level, we've seen time and time again, uh, some influence derived off this prior swing high. And it got pretty messy in here in July and August. But in late September and early October, we're starting to see a little bit more respect off of this level. So I think that's why um, we may have gotten a little bit of indecisiveness up here, and then an eventual pullback. Retreating from that area, looks like the DAX is falling to support yet again. This can be around 12,500 or 12,550, somewhere in that range. Shorter term, holding above this area is going to be pretty crucial, I think, for reclaiming some of the lost ground that the DAX has forfeited so far this week. Again, same for any index or really any chart. Uh, once support breaks, effectively signals to me that further losses might be easier to establish and that there's still some desire among bears or maybe a lack of interest among bulls. Take your pick. But Effectively, just opening the door for a continuation in that direction of the broken technical level and allowing for some further gains or losses. I have a great question here from Imran. Um, what would be the main differences between breaking down a stock or indices chart and a Forex chart? I'm a Forex trader myself, so curious to learn about other markets. That is a great, great question and something that I encounter a lot writing equity content for an FX um, news site. So number one, I'm glad you asked. And number two, really not too much differs at all, uh, especially from a technical analysis standpoint. So the same patterns are going to exist. The same um, follow-throughs on those patterns still exist. So if you have a basis in 
candlestick understanding or chart analysis, pattern recognition, all that stuff. If you are applying that actively on Forex charts, it's going to hold essentially one-to-one -one on a chart of the NASDAQ or of the DAX. Now, there are actually some benefits in the Forex market that might not be present in the stock market. So the benefits in the Forex market, well, you have the longer trading hours. It is the most liquid market in the world, and the major banks are the players. So the Fed, the ECB, the BOE, all those players are the big, big participants. They're going to just offer so much liquidity through their volume of transactions that price can actually be quite smooth. That's in the Forex market. Now, in the stock market, trading hours are not quite as long. And the major players generally, maybe outside of excuse me, maybe outside of Japan, not going to be central banks. They're going to be hedge funds, institutional investors, um, big players, more on the private side. So those factors kind of result in a little bit of a, a spottier price chart when you're looking at equities. So that type of environment can lead to phenomenons like gaps. So you'll have a gap open or a gap higher at the open or a gap lower at the open, which means price is just continuing from its overnight trading. And because it's continuing at the open or at the close, there's a whole range of open space there. Actually, I have a perfect example that happened today. Well, Netflix right here, actually. This gap right here. Price moved from 525 down to 490 real quick. And the market wasn't even open to us retail traders when this move happened. So that's going to just either blow right through your stop or through your limit. Um, or you're going to miss out on a big move that happened overnight because you can place a trade. That is one concern really in the equity market that is not as common in the FX market just because of all the volume and all the liquidity. So that's a key, key difference that I think actually makes the FX market a little bit more attractive when you're looking to trade from a purely technical standpoint. Now, in terms of learning about trading the different markets, I would point you to the Daily FX education suite we have a ton of articles about the similarities and differences in these various markets because in our coverage, we're talking about anything from gold to the U.S. dollar to the Dow Jones in a single article. And in many ways, they're all related. They're all playing off of the same themes. Uh, and because they're all playing off of the same themes, fundamental analysis can translate quite smoothly from FX to equities as well and vice versa. So I suppose that's my five minute uh, dissertation on the similarities and differences in Forex and equity trading. My one sentence conclusion would be that they're very, very similar from a technical analysis standpoint. And I don't think there's any meaningful difference in how those chart patterns are going to play out apart from those gaps and apart from those um, liquidity droughts at times. So if you're confident in your technical analysis on the Euro USD, for example, or maybe on cable, um, I think you would be well positioned to start applying that same analysis on the NASDAQ or on the Dow Jones. I certainly recommend starting in a demo account. IG offers those. Um, but then you can, you know, graduate or transition to a full-time real account. So moving back to the DAX. And after the DAX, we'll look at the ASX 200, the Australian equity index, as it's at a pretty key point, I think. And then we'll look at gold, and then we'll finish out from there. Um, 
So finishing up here with the DAX, falling to support around 12,550. This is going to be an early, early test for bears to see if they want to push any lower. Um, Europe, from a fundamental standpoint, still wrestling with the second wave. They don't really have the same type of stimulus hopes that we have. So fundamentally, there are fewer catalysts to go off of, uh, which might leave them tracking the U.S. indices. Either way, 12,550 going to be an early area of support. If that breaks, further losses might be on the horizon. I would expect this uh, horizontal band drawn off the August low around 12,250 to potentially offer some support if price breaks beneath. Now, looking at the Australia 200 or the ASX 200, we have a prime example of a potential range trading opportunity here. So um, talking about similarities and differences in FX and currency markets or FX and equity markets, um, range trading is something that is common in both. So the ASX has kind of been trapped in between these two upper and lower bounds since early June. And most recently, after some dovish remarks from the RBA, price just ripped higher into resistance. And we actually broke above the top side of this band. So in a longer term view, that's going to be pretty encouraging, I think, for a bullish continuation. However, this move was posted in very short order. And because it was posted so quickly, you can argue maybe it got a little too hot, a little overbought. And that has left it vulnerable to a potential contraction maybe looking to consolidate before continuing higher. So from this point, I think uh, the ASX 200 is well positioned for potential range trades. You can look to uh, aim for some short exposure, setting levels of invalidation slightly above resistance so you don't get um, removed from your trade before it's begun. And that would just be looking to uh, capitalize on maybe a continuation lower. Now, we don't know if that's going to happen. Again, everything I'm discussing is my opinion and my opinion alone and does not constitute trading advice. Um, but from a hypothetical standpoint, let's say price continues lower. Well, an early area of potential support or a potential point of interest uh, would be right around 6,000, maybe slightly north. It's kind of the, um, the midpoint of this range and would be a, a point where a trader might consider either reducing their exposure or moving their stopper limit, um, tailoring their position basically to... to uh, position it better for the second half of the trade. Now, the second half of the trade might see price continue lower, um, potential area of interest down at support. We'll have to see if the ASX really does fall that far. I'm hesitant to suggest that it will. However, we've seen it happen time and time again. So I guess what I would say is that uh, shorter term, the ASX looks to be at a, a pretty important juncture, and that might um, open the doors to some trading opportunities. Now, finishing up for the week, as I've gone way over time, uh, looking at a chart of gold here, four-hour chart. We have... Two months of consolidation, really, just bleeding lower. And back here in early October, it looked like we were building into
I am uh, falling as well. That didn't red level. We might be positioned for a continuation higher. Um, a, conti a continuation higher would see us take aim at these prior swing highs. So 1972, followed by 1992. Just stair stepping the way up, basically up to 2016, and then up to the high of 2076. So, those are going to be areas of potential resistance if we continue higher. Again, if you've read any of my gold analysis or when we've talked about this market in weeks past, uh, I think the longer term fundamental outlook for gold is very, very encouraging. We have central banks printing like they've never printed before. We have interest rates at zero or below in essentially every developed economy in the world. We have talks of stimulus in the U.S. We have talks of infrastructure bills from a potential Biden administration, which would effectively flood the U.S. economy with even more U.S. dollars. All of these things serve to weaken fiat currencies, and especially the U.S. dollar in terms of potential infrastructure or secondary stimulus, a weaker U.S. dollar would help feed into a stronger gold price, and that is what helps me arrive at my um, bullish lean on the outlook for gold over the longer term. Now, it's important to note the longer term, um, not suggesting outright strength here in today's session or tomorrow's session or even next week, but in six months, 12 months, um, I would be quite confident in, uh, in gold prices. But again, that is just one man's opinion. So please, uh, I implore you to conduct your own analysis and arrive at your own conclusions, but support for gold in the coming days, going to be this descending trend line. We've seen a little bit of influence, I think, most notably, though, this area down here where they kind of arrive together around 1850, going to be very, very important for keeping uh, a medium term bullish outlook. So that's all I had on the docket today. I apologize for going way over time, but um, I got some great questions and there was a lot to talk about. So I'd like to thank you all for joining me. I wish the best of luck to you and your trading endeavors in the week ahead.